are back on the record, Steno Squad. Welcome to the Lady Steno Podcast, where I chat with the brightest real-time providers in the field of stenography. And if you are ready to increase your real-time speed and translation rate, head over to www.stenospeedclinic.com today. Let's chat with today's featured guest, Robin Herrera. Robin, are you ready to go on the record? Yes, I'm definitely ready to go on the record. Robin Herrera is a super certified freelance reporter of 35 years, currently working in South Carolina. Now, when I say she's super certified, listen up, Steno Squad. She has her RPR, RMR, CRR, CRC, and wait, there's more. She is California certified and Texas certified. Robin, thank you so much for being a part of this episode. Now take a minute and tell us a little bit about yourself and give us a peek into your personal life. Well, first and foremost, I'm a grandmother. I have a 22 month old, beautiful redheaded granddaughter. And she's actually the reason I relocated back to South Carolina from California. I'm also a dog lover. I have four dogs. And my husband and I spend a lot of time golfing and running, and we love to dance. We dance the Texas two-step, and we love country music. That's a really active lifestyle you have going on there. Yes, it is. It keeps us busy and motivated. Great. So that's actually what this whole podcast is about, is being motivating and inspiring to stenographers of all levels. So let's talk about your court reporting journey, your steno journey. When did you first start it? When did you go to school? And tell us about your educational history in court reporting. Well, my court reporting process actually started in 1980. I graduated from Goshen High School in Goshen, Indiana, and I actually took a Greg shorthand course. That's how old I am. <laughs> my Greg shorthand teacher said I had a real knack for shorthand and suggested that I check out the court reporting program at our local community college. So I attended Michiana College of Commerce in September of 1980 to May of 1983, and I graduated with an associate's degree in court reporting science. Oh, that's good, that's pretty fast. And you learned about it through a teacher? Yes, a high school Greg shorthand teacher. That's really cool. And so what, what theory did you learn for the machine shorthand? I did not learn a specific theory. Our instructor just taught us different things and it wasn't a specific name theory. And then throughout the last 35 years, I've implemented writing styles and brief forms and what I've learned from many seminars and classes that I've taken about real time. So I kind of just have a hodgepodge of real time writing styles. And so your writing style today, do you brief a lot? Do you phrase a lot? How, how, does, how does that work? I do both. I brief, I phrase, and when I panic, I write things out. Yeah, when you're under pressure, you just go back to what you used to do. That's right. What's your view on the number bar? I think the number bar for real-time writers is an essential part of writing. For instance, if you want to write the word three, you would stroke the word three. If you would like to write the number three, you would use your number bar and write the number three. It's easy and it's flawless and your numbers come out perfectly every time. I also have brief forms for the numbers one through 100 and they're all one stroke. So I really don't have any problems at all with my numbers. Were you always using the number bar starting when you were in school? No, actually I learned not to use the number bar because our instructor felt that it was too easy to make errors. I began using the number bar somewhere along the 1990s. So it seems that you changed a lot from what you learned in school. There's a lot of things that you decided to do differently, such as the number bar and using all the materials that you've learned from seminars. But was there ever a time that you felt that you were unable to provide real time? Is, is that why you were seeking out more information? Yes, definitely. Again, I really started working on my real time in the, I would say the late 1980s and the early 1990s. 
just resolving simple conflicts there, there, and there, two, two, and two. And I just started with the basic conflicts and just worked on those a couple every day and um, changed my writing style to where it is now where I really don't have any conflicts and my prefixes and suffixes all just hook onto my words. And it's just been a learning process over the last 35 years. So what other steps did you take to become a real-time reporter other than resolving the conflicts? Well, part of becoming a real-time reporter is also knowing your software, also knowing your hardware. You have to know how to go to a deposition and set up five iPads and get everybody hooked up and troubleshoot things. And the writing is obviously the most important element, but there is just so much to real-time writing than only writing. And also preparation is so key for what you do every day. And a little bit of prep time can make your life so much easier at a real-time job. What kind of prep work are you talking about? Job dictionaries, primarily. Mm -hmm. Getting word lists, spellings of names, spellings of streets, spellings of companies. Looking through the pleadings and finding what you might need. Also having strokes for an unidentified speaker and strokes for different things that maybe are unexpected that you don't have to worry about what it is. You can always put it in, just unidentified speaker or something like that. That is some great advice. That's It's like a, a wild card in a way for you never know what would happen, but at least you could have some clarity on the real-time feed. Exactly. So as I mentioned in the, in the introduction, you are super, super certified. You're certified in multiple states, but it all started with your first certification. What made you decide to get certified? Well, when I was a brand new baby reporter in Elkhart, Indiana, I was hired to work in juvenile court. The court reporter I did my internship with, her judge really liked me and wanted to give me a chance to start. However, I began as a court reporter and I had not passed the RPR. Indiana does not have a state CSR law, so you could work as soon as you graduated from school. Every other court reporter in Elkhart County had at least their RPR and several had their merit. So I felt really compelled to get my RPR to prove that I was as good as the other people at work. So I just started that process doing that pretty much because everybody else had it and I wanted to be as good as everybody else. Robin, that's actually a perfect example of the importance of the company that you keep. Your story actually reminds me of a famous quote by Jim Rohn. He says, you are the average of the five people you spend the most time with. And I like to put a Lady Steno twist on that, if I may, by saying, you are the average of the five stenographers you spend the most time with. So if you're hanging around court reporters who are go-getters, who are constantly striving to improve their skills or getting new clients or promotions or whatever, those reporters will shape you as a court reporter. If you're a steno student and you become best friends with another student who is excelling in class, that behavior and those traits will have a great influence on you. I mean, I can go on and on about this, but if you're interested in learning more about this phenomenon, look up emotional contagion. Steno Squad, Robin and I will be right back, but first, Let's take a minute to thank our sponsor. Howdy, y'all. The Lady Stano Speed Clinic is fixing to come to Texas. <laughs> oh my gosh. Excuse my horrible impersonation, but wait, is it called an impersonation? I, anyway, anyway, on a serious note, the Lady Stano Speed Clinic is coming to Texas. April 4th through the 6th in Dallas and April 8th through the 10th in Houston. Now, the Lady Center Speed Clinic is a phenomenal hands-on workshop where participants systematically learn how to write over 3,000 everyday phrases in just one stroke. This is for stenographers of all levels who want to write faster, cleaner, and shorter than ever before. There are only six stenographers per clinic and there are only a few seats open in both cities. You do not want to miss out on this exciting opportunity. Head over to www.stenospeedclinic.com to register today.
And we are back, Seto Squad, with Robin Herrera. Now, Robin, you got your first certification, your RPR, and I'm sure you were proud of yourself, but then you earned five more. What made you decide to get certified in all these states and continue to strive for excellence? Well, my best friend, who was my mentor and I did my internship with in Indiana, she had her certificate of merit, so I wanted to get mine too. So I think I passed that somewhere in the early 1990s. I actually believe it was 1991. And as far as the different state certifications, I was transferred to Texas. So I had to get my Texas CSR in order to work as a court reporter. And then my husband was transferred from Texas to California. And again, I had to get my California CSR in order to be a court reporter in California. So I got those certifications as a necessity. And also in California, I worked for the Kern County Superior Courts, and we received a 7% increase in salary for being real-time certified. And we also had a program where if you were CART certified, you could provide CART services for hearing impaired defendants, and you got an extra per diem for that on top of your salary. It was pretty much financially driven. Also, I've heard that Texas and California are the, I guess, most difficult states to be certified in. Was that true back then as well? I believe so. The Texas CSR, the the skills exam is exactly like an RPR. It's 225, 200, and 180. And then there's a 50-part written exam, which has general questions about Texas law for court reporters and some English and spelling and such as that. The California CSR is four part live dictation at 200 words a minute for 15 minutes. Wow. And then there's also a, an English exam specific to English and you have to have a 70% pass rate. And then there is a practical examination which is basically all the CSR laws for California which is also another 100 questions. So California is definitely the toughest CSR test the speed on the skills exam is not fast. It's only 200, but it is for 15 minutes and it's four voice live. Do you think that should be the standard for every state, the California test? I would say that the best court reporters I've met who aren't nationally certified are definitely in California because they do have to pass the stringent CSR test. So I know there's a lot of debate about not enough people are being certified in California. I think one of the last tests in September, maybe only five people were able to pass. Do you think the test is too hard or do you think they need to make it less hard? I guess, do you think they need to make it easier? No, definitely not easier. And I'll share an experience that I had. I had been a court reporter for like 26 years when I went to California to take my CSR. And so I thought, I don't need to study. I don't need to practice. I just need to go in and take the exam. Well, I read through the law for the practical skills portion for the California law because I didn't know those laws. For example, prelim hearings have to be filed within 10 days and, and different things such as that. So I studied that, but I did not pass the English portion the first time. The California CSR exam English portion is very stringent. So I had to wait another couple months and take that again. And I had been a reporter for 26 years and didn't pass the English the first time. I probably wouldn't pass the English either. I mean, I have to use a proofreader before I send out any transcript. Uh, it definitely is something that you really have to, to study for. And I think sometimes it can be stylistic that some people have preferences on how their transcript reads, depending if they want to use a colon or start a new paragraph. The California CSR English exam I think one of the things that stumped me actually was the whomever and whoever. I couldn't remember the rule. <laughs> and it was a 70% pass rate. And I think not a 70% pass rate, because you had to have 70% to pass. And I just didn't know that rule. And I actually think my score was like a 69.7 because it's weighted for different questions. Oh, you're just so there. I mean, obviously it is passable. There's plenty of CSRs in California and Texas. So if they can pass it, another court reporter or student should be able to pass it with the proper practice and studying. So I want to bring you to your real time life. You've given us a lot of good stories and I'm just wondering, is there a moment that you would consider your worst moment while real timing? I don't really think so. Why is that? I've, that's the first time I've heard that. Well, I started real timing 
every day as an official in California. And we just had to hook up to our judge every day and do real time. So it just became, I don't know, just part of your daily routine. And yeah, sometimes you would have bad witnesses or sometimes you would get behind or sometimes you would even get sleepy and, you know, your writing got, got a little bit lax, but it was never where anybody ever complained or said anything. It, and I, I guess maybe I didn't feel under so much pressure because I was writing for my judge instead of attorneys who were paying for real time like I do now in freelance. So you were real timing for your judge for multiple judges, right? Yes. And then now you've transitioned into freelance reporting in South Carolina. Yes. And how is that transition going from providing real time for a judge versus for attorneys? Well, doing real time in South Carolina is actually pretty easy because there aren't a lot of real time reporters. South Carolina has no state CSR law and many of the freelance reporters are not certified at all. So it's not what I provide. The attorneys are just happy with. They just think it's the greatest thing ever because not many people here are willing to provide real time. So that also makes it very lucrative for you. Also in South Carolina, the attorneys aren't as aware or as willing to pay for real time as maybe they are in California or New York or some of the bigger cities. So it, it's kind of getting the word out there. What do you mean by getting the word out there? Getting the word out that reporters are able to provide this service. And while we're talking about being lucrative, what was your most lucrative assignment as a real timer? And what was the case about? I think I've done five death penalties over the course of my court reporting career. I did two death penalty trials in South Carolina when I was an official here. And I did three death penalty trials in California, two as the second chair and one as the lead reporter. And I would say that those are the most lucrative because we had to provide real time for the trial and then a daily copy at the end of the day. And we would bill for an O and two every day. And then when the appeal came through, we provided another five copies. And then several years later, we would provide CDs of all the hearings and we got paid for those also. So I was thinking on an average of one death penalty trial, probably $30,000 for four months worth of work. $30,000, four months of work. And you mentioned something, a lead court reporter and uh, first chair, was it? What, what, what did you mention? What is that? Yes, in California, when there's a death penalty filed, the court that the case is filed in, that court reporter is the lead reporter. And then that reporter is able to select another reporter who works for the same county or the same court system to be the second reporter. And the days are split up in AM, PM shifts, and you provide real time and daily copy. The lead reporter is also in charge of putting the transcript together, putting the index together, and making sure everything flows smoothly. Okay, I understand now. So does that mean that you were the one who got 30000 or was it split between the other court reporter? Well, that 30000 was my portion, and that's also not including salary. That's just only on the transcript income. Wow, that's a lot. But it's a lot of work. It's, it's a lot of work. home every day and doing sometimes as much as 300 pages of jury selection to get out in a final form the next day. So it's a lot of work. That's why they split it half a.m. and p.m. And so then maybe you only have 125 or 150 pages to get out. And how do you make it so that your scoping is faster, that you're able to turn it around so fast? The way to make your scoping faster is to be a clean writer and is to make sure that you don't have on translates and to punctuate when you write and use your job dictionary and things come up and especially in real time trials, we usually keep a log of words that come up and suggested brief forms for the other reporter. So when you come in for your shift, whether it's an AM or PM shift, you'll look and say, oh, this court reporter has a brief form for this. And so you can use those and implement those. And there's really, you know, unless you misstroke something, everything pretty much comes out the way it's supposed to. It seems like just by being a real-time writer, or even if you're not providing it for somebody else, but just for your own self, 
being a clean writer just saves you so much time. And when you're saving time on work, then you could use it for other things that you enjoy. Exactly. I don't use a Scopus now because I have time to edit my own work and I choose to edit my own work to continue on building my dictionary and to continue fixing things that I find that aren't correct. And then I send my jobs to a proofreader. So bring us to today. What is your current practice routine like? I don't practice. I just work every day. So you mentioned that you go through your dictionary when you're scoping, you're, you're, you're always working on fixing things, but why is it that you feel that you're not maybe doing speed building or finger drills? Because I've been a court reporter 35 years and I don't really need to do speed building or finger drills. And so now I'm implementing trying to write words in two strokes, or I just got a new machine and I put the extended DZ key on it. So I'm adding the D and the Z to my words and making them plural without coming back for another stroke. So I'm adding those to my dictionary constantly is what I'm working on right now. I, I always used to come back for the S and come back for the D and now I'm, I'm, I got the extended key. And so I'm changing my writing now and doing that, even though I've been reporting for 35 years. And another thing that you need to stay on top of is your software. You need to get your updates. You need to learn your new software. Don't become stagnant. Stagnant. That's a great word. Stagnant with what you have and say, oh, I'm on version three. It works just fine. I don't need version 13. You do. You need to learn. And the more you learn, the more you stay excited about your job. And once you become stagnant and don't want to learn something new and don't want to be a better writer, that's when you don't like your job anymore. That's so true. And then without without getting more knowledge and um, staying on top of things, things just get harder. They get Definitely. harder, not easier. It may seem easier to just stick with the software you know and not learn all the new tricks, but those new tricks and the new updates will save you a lot of time if you just take a few minutes or hours to, to learn how to use them. Exactly. I worked with a court reporter in California who was still using a DOS computer. Oh, my gosh. Never upgraded. He bought the new machine and bought a new computer and never wanted to learn it. He was still using a DOS system from the 1980s. And that's what he still produced his transcript on. And he had one of the old manual writers with a tray, mm -hmm. and a little computer thing underneath it. And he still uses that today because he didn't want to learn anything new. Okay. Hopefully. I wonder if he's listening <laughs> to this podcast. I doubt it. I doubt it, I, I, I doubt it too. <laughs> so you've actually given us a lot of great advice, but what is the best advice that you have received, the best court reporting related advice that you have received? I think the best court reporting advice I have received is don't be afraid to look at yourself critically and to admit when you make mistakes and you do things wrong and to learn from what you've done incorrectly and to just move on and, and try to be a better writer and try to do better at your job and the advice about staying abreast of the current technology and, you know, getting new computers and getting a new writer and, and learning your new software. There's nothing more valuable than that. I'm 56 years old and I have one exam I haven't taken yet. And that's the RDR. And I still plan to get that certification before I retire. Excellent. Always strive to improve. And what about for students that are listening or new freelance reporters or court reporters who have been around for 30 plus years, what advice would you give it to them? You're your own worst enemy. Don't be afraid to show your writing. Don't be afraid to show what you can do. Everybody makes mistakes. Don't be afraid to get out there and do it. Nobody's perfect. Nobody expects you to be perfect. Look to mentors, look to experienced court reporters and learn from them and just go out and do it and do it for yourself and then gradually get up to where you feel like you can do it for someone else and don't take jobs that are over your head. Start something that you're comfortable with and just move on from there. Well, Robin, thank you so much for all the advice and all the tips that you've given us. And I'm really thankful that you are a guest on the Lady Sano podcast. You're welcome.